Lord God, we thank you for uh, this time today to uh, look at your word and to be amazed at you and what you uh, have done in history in order to uh, pave the way for our Savior to come and to save us and uh, welcome us into your kingdom and your family. And so, Lord, we pray um, that you would give us wisdom and understanding and insight. And uh, it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> last week we went through and talked about um, Genesis, basically. We went through all of Genesis, and we talked about Job, and I failed to mention a verse from Job that points to Christ. That was one of the, the goals I had uh, for this class, was to show how every book of the Bible points to Christ in some way. And so... Uh, one of the verses that was on the page was how Job is talking about how he knows his Redeemer lives. And he knows that even after he dies, he will stand in the flesh and see him face to face. And so Job knows that there is a Redeemer, Christ. And he knows that there is a resurrection because of Christ. And uh, so I just I wanted to highlight that and I forgot last week. So, um, so this week uh, we're picking up basically 400 years after where we left off. And if you look in the overview book on page 10, there is a timeline. <coughs> And uh, what we covered last week uh, was basically this first part up here. This is uh, a timeline of the whole Old Testament. And we covered this much to the death of uh, Joseph uh, last week. And this week we are picking up down here uh, with uh, the birth of Moses. And so there's this intervening period of time where Israel has been in Egypt and they have been prospering and uh, some things have happened and so that's where we're at okay and so today we're going to cover uh, basically uh, to the end of the life of Moses here and and uh, that's that's where we're at today okay <clears throat> so in Exodus uh, just just a question uh, no guilt or embarrassment or anything but how many of you read some of the reading or all of the reading okay okay good 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 um because that will that will help you guys all right so uh exodus 1 7 all right the people of israel were fruitful and increased greatly they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them and uh, there arose a new king over egypt you guys remember when Joseph was there, he loved, the Pharaoh loved Joseph, right? Joseph made Egypt wealthy beyond imagining. And the Pharaoh loved Joseph. But now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's been 400 years. Um, and at some point along the way, Israel's growing and they're getting a little scary. And this king now doesn't even remember Joseph. And uh, so um, <clears throat> Exodus 1.13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. And uh, in the overview book on page 21, there's uh, an artist's uh, picture of uh, the Israelites as slaves building for the Egyptians. Um, <clears throat> so the idea was to oppress them, to make them slaves, and to keep them under control. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. They were so numerous now at this point that they could have um, created a big uprising and caused a lot of trouble. So then Pharaoh comes up with this uh, great idea, and he commands the people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile but he shall let every daughter live. Okay? Start murdering the sons, then uh, you're not going to have them grow up to be soldiers, and plus they won't be able to reproduce as fast, right? <laughs> if there aren't any guys. 
So, it's a good idea. <clears throat> so it's about this time that the Lord decides he needs to raise up the deliverer for his people. And Moses is born. Uh, so we're in the uh, preparing a deliverer section. And Moses is born. His mom can't can't let anything happen to him, so she hides him. And when he gets too old to hide, she has to she has to do something. So, and there's uh, in the um, whole Bible storybook on page 48, there's a uh, a photo of a basket that was uncovered around this time, and this is uh, very much like the basket that Moses' mom would have used uh, to put him in. She covered it with pitch, and you know she she they were supposed to throw the babies in the Nile, so she puts the baby in the Nile. She did what Pharaoh said, uh, and then it's just like Lord, take care of my baby. Goes down the Nile. Well, Pharaoh's daughter happens to be down at the river bathing with her her entourage, and sees the basket, and they get the basket, and it's this little Hebrew boy. She's like, wow. And Miriam has been following along and uh, goes up to uh, Pharaoh's daughter and says, you want me to go get one of the Hebrew women to uh, nurse it for you? And she's like, yeah, go. So Miriam goes and gets Moses' mom. Moses' mom comes and uh, Pharaoh's uh, daughter gives Moses to his mom and says, uh, will you nurse uh, this child for me until he's weaned and then bring him back? And I'll pay you wages. So Moses' mom had a little job uh, working for Pharaoh's daughter, nursing her own kid. But at some point, she does have to bring Moses back. <coughs> and um, so um, Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses because uh, and, and, and uh, because she drew him out of the water, and he becomes her son. So Moses is now part of the royal family by adoption and uh, grows up with the wealth and learning all about how the courts work and everything else, how the Egyptian society works. When he gets older, knowing he's a Hebrew, because uh, he would have been circumcised, plus he would have looked different anyway, uh, he knows he's a Hebrew and he, he gets very interested in his own people and he starts going out and spending time with them. And in the course of time, he ends up murdering uh, an Egyptian. And that comes to light, and Pharaoh wants Moses so that he can be punished. And so Moses runs off. He runs, he leaves Egypt, and he runs uh, to Midian, and he hides out in Midian. There he meets uh, Jethro, <laughs> who becomes his father-in-law when he marries Zipporah. And he's very comfortable there. He's a shepherd. Uh, he ends up having some children. And uh, one day, while he's out, you know, he's there for 40 years probably or so. One day he's out uh, with the flocks, and he sees this weird thing up at the mountain, this bush that's on fire but there's no smoke, it's not burning up, it's just on fire. So he goes up to this bush, and the angel of the Lord speaks to him out of the bush. And uh, he says, uh, <clears throat> uh, from Exodus 3, 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, he was afraid to look at God. And God continues to talk to Moses. I, uh, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. <clears throat> and Moses has every excuse to not have to do this. Lord, I'm the wrong guy. I can't do it. I can't speak well. Um, they're not going to accept me. And eventually, he's like, you know, 
the Lord's not letting me out of this, so I have to do this. I have to go and do this. And in the process of that, God tells Moses his name. He says, I am who I am. And he says, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And he tells Moses how he is going to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. He says, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go. And so say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And you see the Lord in all caps. Uh, that is a reference to the Hebrew text when it says Yahweh. God's name, Yahweh, that he told Moses. Um, so, he goes back to Egypt. He talks to the Israelites and the elders and tells them what he's about. And the Lord sent him. And uh, he tells them, and this is what the Lord said, I am the Lord. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, they have probably forgotten a whole lot of everything. It's been uh, 400 years that they've been in Egypt, and uh, they haven't necessarily been keeping the customs up or teaching like they should have, but they would have remembered these names. You know, They would have known Jacob, and, and uh, they would have known Abraham and Isaac probably, this is their God. What the heck is going on? He's trying to bench press 400. But notice that God is always about his people. And he's making a nation here. They have been growing and prospering in Egypt. And now he's going to make them into a nation. And he's going to call them out and uh, make them his own, as he said. And to give them the land that he promised, the promised land to, uh, to them. So, then there's the plagues. Um, you know, Pharaoh laughs Moses out and uh, begins making lives even harder for the Israelites. Um, and, you know, Israel's like upset at first about Moses. You're just making things worse. He's not going to let us go. But the plagues eventually... You know, convince the Israelites that this is a real God. This is not some fake God. You know, this is a real God. He's really doing things. And there was the uh, the Nile turned to blood. There were frogs and gnats and flies. The livestock died. There were boils uh, on the people. Then there was fiery hail coming out of the sky. And then the locusts ate up all the crops. And then there was darkness over the whole land. And all the time, Israel where they were at was not affected. It only affected Egypt. And um, so then came the last plague. The firstborn would die. The firstborn of every family would die. Even the, even the livestock, the firstborn of the livestock would die. And God doesn't just protect Israel in the same way. Israel has to do something in order to be protected from this one. They have to get a lamb, and they have to, it has to be a perfect, spotless lamb, and they have to sh kill that lamb, shed its blood, and then paint the doorposts of their homes with the blood from this lamb, so that when the angel of death would come through to slaughter the firstborn, when it saw that a substitute death had already covered this home, it would move on and would go to another home. So you guys see how that's a picture of Christ, right? This is the Passover. And uh, one, of, one of the greatest pictures of Christ in all of the Old Testament and certainly in Exodus. Um, so they had to kill the Passover lamb and do that. Well, Pharaoh finally relents and he calls Moses in the middle of the night when this is happening and he says, you guys go, get out. And the Lord had caused <laughs> the Egyptians to be so afraid of the Israelites that the Israelites just plundered them. 
Uh, God said, go and ask them for things and they will give them. So they went to uh, the Egyptians and they said, give us your gold, give us your silver, give us your cloth, give us your livestock, give us everything that you have. And they were just totally plundered. And they took all that stuff with them as they left. It didn't take long before Pharaoh was like, what have I done? I've lost all the slaves. They have totally plundered us. We're, you know, and after all the plagues that had happened, we're totally ruined. And I'm a laughing stock in front of all the nations. He's like, I'm going after them. I'm going to get them back. I'm going to get all the plunder back. And so he gets all of his army together and he goes after them. Now the Lord had led the Israelites down to the Red Sea and they were in this little bowl of a valley that there's no way to get out and they see the Egyptian army coming. There's nowhere to run. They're trapped. And, you know, they cry out to Moses, what are you doing? And so Moses um, lifts up the staff the Red Sea parts. A wall of water on the left. A wall of water on the right. And they go across. The Israelites, they go across fleeing from the Egyptian army who's coming. And they're still crossing the sea when the Egyptians catch up and they start to go through. But the Lord slows them down. The chariot wheels get clogged up with the mud and, and the soldiers, the Egyptians, are having trouble getting through the muddy ground. But the Israelites are on dry ground as they go through. <coughs> so after the Israelites are through, Moses uh, lifts up his hand and the waters come together again, drowning the entire army of Pharaoh. So not only were they plundered and devastated by the plagues, but now the, the army's been wiped out. And God told Moses that he would get glory from Pharaoh, and he did. The greatest power um, at the time lay waste um, by God and only God. No, nothing else could explain it. Alright, so this happened around 1446 uh, BC, right around there, the Exodus. I have something to drink this week. Everybody's making fun of how much I'm talking. I don't talk this much, but there we go. <laughs> and I'm just, I can't even, I can't even keep up with myself. All right. <clears throat> so, the Exodus is happening. They go about, where are they going? Where are they going? Anybody? They're going to the promised land, right? They're going to Mount Sinai first because that's where the Lord told them, uh, told Moses to bring them to Sinai. And then they're going to go to the promised land. Take the promised land. So they're on their way to Sinai right now, Mount Sinai, where Moses saw the, uh, the burning bush. Three days in, uh, they've run out of water. They've run out of food, and the complaining starts. And uh, so the Lord uh, provides through Moses uh, water in various ways so that the people can uh, drink and feed the livestock. And then he provides manna. Manna is just this powder on the ground in the morning that they collect, and it's like they can bake it and make bread crazy, miraculous thing that's never been seen since. And it was enough to feed the millions of people uh, who were wandering around in the wilderness. Um, <clears throat> so, you can't just go wandering around everywhere and not uh, annoy people. Amalek was like, no, you're not coming through here. And he sends an army down. And uh, so, Moses raises his staff up on the mountain Joshua's down there on the battlefield fighting as the general, you know. And uh, whenever Moses keeps his staff up, the Israelites are winning. But when he puts the staff down, they start to lose. And Amalek's uh, army wins. So he's got, he's got his buddies up there who help him. And they hold his arms up so he can, he can uh, hold it up the whole time. And they defeat Amalek. Uh, and you know what was that? That was showing to the Israelites that Moses was God's person. Listen to him, obey him. And that it was God's power who was doing it, not their own efforts, right? Um, <clears throat> so, that's a lot of people. 
Uh, you can imagine there's a few problems, and uh, Moses ends up spending all day judging or bring cases. You know, so and so said something, they did this and that, and Moses is he knows um, what's right and wrong, and so they keep coming to him. His father-in-law, Jethro, remember him? He uh, he hears about what's going, on and he comes out, and he sees how Moses is spending all day judging. He's like, he can't do this. Appoint guys, appoint. Uh, some judges to help you out. And so Moses does that. And uh, that's kind of the beginning of uh, uh, appointing men to, to assist. All right, so um, in the overview book on 31, page 31, there's just an image uh, of uh, the plains there in front of Mount Sinai. The Sinai wilderness. So this is where the people finally gather when they come to Sinai. And <clears throat> so Moses has a lot of things to tell the people from the Lord. Uh, one of them is, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles wings, brought you to myself. Therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so this is, this is what God wants. He wants a people of his own, a treasured possession who uh, reflect him in the world uh, by being holy and righteous. And so that's uh, what he is hoping. He has saved them from uh, slavery in Egypt. Now he wants them to reflect him in the world. Uh, in thanks for what he is, how he has saved them. So Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai, and the Lord comes down to the top of Mount Sinai, and they meet, and he gets the Ten Commandments and a lot of the law. He comes down to uh, the people and and uh, makes a covenant with the people and with. Uh, God <clears throat> and the people say yes all the words of the Lord uh, that the Lord has spoken we will do and Moses takes blood sacrifices animals takes the blood and he sprinkles the people with the blood cleansing them uh, sanctifying them setting them apart from the world as his people and they have agreed to this covenant so this is the blood of the covenant does that sound like anything else Blood of the covenant. You know, Jesus, Jesus said, "This is my blood, blood of the new covenant, uh, given for you." We talk about that every week when we do communion, and so we have pic uh, Christ pictured there as well. Um, <clears throat> Moses receives a lot of um, the law from the Lord when he's up on the mountain. Um, he's up there for forty days long time. And the Israelites start thinking, what is going on here? But he learns about the tabernacle. Moses gets instructions for how to worship. On which page is this on? And in the overview, it's on page 26. You can see the tabernacle, uh, what it looked like, uh, and the altar there, and, and washing basins, and all kinds of stuff. And on page 30, there's an artist's rendition of what the Ark of the Covenant may have looked like. Uh, tablets of the commandments were put in there and it became it was put into the holy of holies the central part of the uh, temple eventually and it represented God's throne this was where his presence was and uh, <clears throat> anyway so uh, Moses is learning about how to do this how God wants to be worshipped and the people down below are like, well, what happened to this Moses guy? Did he, did he die? Did he get eaten? Did he run off? It was too much for him? We have no idea what's happened to this guy. So they come to Aaron, the people, and they say, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, you know, we don't know where he's become him. And Aaron, what was he thinking? He was probably terrified because there were millions of people and just him. So he takes their gold and he says, he put the gold in the fire and this 
this uh, calf came out. It just came out. It was, it was miraculous. Um, and there's a picture in the whole Bible the book of what some of the uh, calf idols look like. Um, where is it? Uh, page uh, 59. Page 59, there's a little picture of a, a calf idol in there. It might look something like that. <coughs> Um, so when uh, Moses comes down, he's not happy. And the people have begun worshiping this thing. And the worst of it all for me is uh, they're saying that, uh, you know, look at this calf, the one who delivered us and brought us out of Egypt. Ugh. No wonder the Lord was angry. And they were worshiping like the pagans do with carnal activities. You know, it's horrible. And so Moses takes the calf, grinds it into dust, makes them all drink it, and there's a plague. Uh, and and the uh, and the, pe the Levites go through and slaughter a bunch of the people who are worshiping the idol. All right, so they they end up. Uh, the Lord forgives them, and uh, they have to build the tabernacle. So they build the tabernacle, all the things. The Lord puts his spirit on some people who are gifted, and they make all of the implements of the tabernacle, which is where they would worship the Lord. And as soon as that's completed, and the last part is in place, a cloud of the Lord came and settles over uh, the uh, tabernacle. Uh, and the cloud of the Lord, this is the last verse on page 6, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the, in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Okay, so they've been at Sinai now for a while. They've gotten the law. They've built the tabernacle. And they're about ready to go. But there's still some lessons to be learned. So uh, Leviticus is basically rules for the priests. There's very little narrative in Leviticus. There's some. But mostly it's how to live holy. The first verse on there, be holy for I am holy. And it's about how to lead, live a clean, holy, righteous life. And a lot of it has to do with keeping the Sabbath holy, um, abstaining from sexual immorality, uh, eating clean foods and not unclean foods. But then it's, it's a lot of rules for the priests. These are the sacrifices acceptable to me. This is when you do them. This is where you do them. This is how you do them. These are the holidays you will observe. This is when you do them, where you do them, how you do them, and a lot of rules for the priests. Uh, one of the things that's in here that points to Christ is the Day of Atonement. Once a year, one of the holidays, the, the festivals, the feasts, they would sacrifice for the sin of the whole nation. And, of course, we see in Christ that he was the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. No longer be done year after year because Christ fulfilled it all. And uh, Leviticus 18.5 says that if uh, you keep my statutes and my rules, you will live. But we know that it's impossible to perfectly keep all of the statutes and the rules that Christ did. And so it's through Christ that we live because he was able to keep all of the statutes and the rules. Uh, the last verse there I put for Le Leviticus is where we get the concept of the regulative principle of worship, which means that we only worship God in a way that he has told us. We can't just make up however we want to worship the Lord. We need to worship him the way he wants to be worshiped. And one of the things that happens is the sons of Aaron go in and they're doing things that were not prescribed there, there was a, a special kind of um, worship they were supposed to do, but they varied from it. They were doing their own thing, their own way, and the Lord kills them. And so the lesson was, worship me the way I want to be worshipped, not the way you think I want to be worshipped. Okay, so all of Leviticus takes uh, place over a course of about two months. Then we get to Numbers. Um, we're still around 1446. They've been there about a year, or not as not as long as a year. It's hard to tell exactly, but they're about to leave, and um, <clears throat> so they do a census. 
of the fighting men, 20 years and old, older for the fighting men. So all the 20 years and older men were counted, 603,000. That was just the fighting men. So the estimates of how many people were there with the, the older people who couldn't fight, the, the younger kids, the women, um, upwards of 2 million people. Uh, that's a lot of people. <clears throat> okay, so they've been at Sinai. Now they're going to the promised land. Um, the Lord gives Aaron a blessing to put over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You may have heard that before. And then, oh, here it is, the second year, second month, 20th day. Um, the cloud lifted. This first time, the cloud has been sitting over the tabernacle, right? The cloud lifted. The cloud is moving away. It's like, hey, guys, it's time. First time, we got to remember all we practice. So they're packing everything up. They have a certain order. The tribes go in, and they're following the cloud. Um, and what happens when they get going? Complaining. This numbers is about complaining. There's a lot of complaining. And whenever they complain, it's either uh, we have no water, we have no food, or why aren't we in Egypt? Because things are so much better there. And the Lord gets angry, and he does something to wake the, the people up. He has a fire one time. He has uh, he brings them. They're, they're saying they don't have any meat. They're tired of manna. We want meat. So he brings so many quail in that it's three feet high, just piled up, all the quail. And everyone gathers way more than they could ever eat before it spoils, and then he brings a plague and kills a bunch of them. Um, and then Aaron and Miriam uh, start uh, an uprising, say, why is Moses always in charge? The Lord speaks through us. And so the Lord judges them as well. Um, well, eventually they get to Kadesh, Barnea. Uh, and uh, in the, there's a map in this book that I'm hiding on page 68 that shows uh, where the spies went. We're getting close. Moses sends the spies ahead. They spend 40 days going through Canaan, the promised land, searching it out. They go all the way up to the top, which is like 200 miles, and then they come back. And they're there for 40 days spying it out. And when they come back, their message is basically... You wouldn't believe how wonderful this land is. It's so lush. It's so beautiful. It's There's wells already dug. There's crops already planted, vineyards. And they bring back this bunch of grapes it takes two men to carry. And it's so wonderful. But there's no way we can go in. There's no way we can beat these people. The cities have walls around them. Some of the people are giants. There's no way we can take this. And the people weep. You know, Moses has promised them this land, and they come, and now they can't get in. But Joshua and Caleb were two of the spies, and they're like, no, don't listen to that. The Lord is on our side. We can take them. Don't be afraid. We can do it. <laughs> um, but uh, the people are like, stone them. Stone Joshua and Caleb. And let's go back to Egypt. And so the Lord judges them, and... Uh, he says that, uh, where am I at? I gotta have myself. It's like a paragraph up yeah. the uh, Numbers 14 33, part of the judgment. Uh, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. All of the people who are fighting age and able to go in and fight are going to die in the wilderness. But the children, many of the children who saw the miracles, who saw the plagues, who went through the Red Sea, they will live, and they will grow, and they will remember, and they'll be able to go into the Promised Land. But all of the fighting age people are going to die. And so they go, and they're wandering in the wilderness. And um, there's a, one account where they're complaining for water again, and uh, it's in the wilderness of Zen. There's a picture of a place in, in Zen there in, in the uh, whole uh, Bible story book on page 70. And uh, 
Moses was supposed to go to a rock like he had done before and speak to the rock and water would come out. But Moses, for whatever reason, he was angry at the people, he was frustrated, they're complaining again, whatever reason, he makes himself out to be God and he doesn't listen to the Lord and he strikes the rock twice and he says, here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Meaning me and Aaron will bring water for you, taking the glory upon himself rather than giving it to the Lord where it should be. And so the Lord lets the water come out of the rock for the people, but he tells Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. So that's quite, quite a judgment upon him. Another time in there, there was complaining, and the Lord brings about these poisonous snakes everywhere. And the solution the Lord has then is they fashion a, uh, Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And Christ references this very thing and this serpent as uh, the type of himself. And he says, the Son of Man will be lifted up like the servant. And whoever looks at the Son of Man will live. And so uh, that's another place in Numbers where we see uh, Christ. All right, I'm just <clears throat> Almost out of time. Okay, so they're getting serious. There's a map in overview on page 32. <clears throat> and uh, we're, we're, we're in the blue line now. They've been wandering around the red dotted line in the wilderness, but now they are uh, following the blue line. They're going to go up to the promised land again. And we're getting near the end of the four years. And the Lord is giving them opportunity to fight and have success. And the first time, it's against Sion. And uh, they just want to, they, they send a delegation to them and say, hey, we just want to pass through your land. We're not going to take your food or crops or we won't even drink from your wells. Just let us go through your land. And he's like, no way. And so he sends an army. And the Lord lets the Israelites wipe them out and take over their cities. Uh, and they lived in the, in the land of the Amorites. And then Og, the king of Bashan, does the same thing, comes out against them. And the Lord gives them uh, into the hand of the Israelites and they possess his land. <clears throat> then they are getting near to Moab. You see they're, they're heading north here to Moab, next to the Red Sea in the upper right corner. And uh, Balak is there, and he's, he's terrified because he's seen what has happened. So he sends for this guy, Balaam, who's like a diviner. You know, He sends for Balaam, hey, you come here and you curse these people so that they won't be able to hurt me. So this is the story of the donkey, right? So Balaam's on his way, riding his donkey, and the donkey's misbehaving because the Lord doesn't is, uh, has this uh, invisible angel in the way ready to kill Balaam because he's going to curse his people. Um, and then the donkey speaks to Balaam and says, what have I ever done to you? Why are you beating me? And uh, so, you know, Balaam... The Lord wants Balaam to know that you're not going to curse my people. You're going to say only what I tell you to say. And I will tell you what to say. And then Balaam has several oracles when he gets to Balak. Uh, and the king is not happy with Balaam because Balaam keeps blessing the people, not cursing the people. But in the end, Balaam tells Balak how he can defeat the Israelites. Send in your women to entice the men to sexual immorality and to worship your gods. And then their god will take care of them. And it works. Until the Lord forgives them and then wipes out Moab. <clears throat> so they end up defeating them anyway. One of the things that uh, Balaam prophesies, you'll see bolded, I see him but not now, I behold him but not near, near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. In reference to Christ, who will come as the King of Kings. Okay, so 
<clears throat> they end up there across from, um, if you flip to page 42 in the overview book, there's a little close up of the map, and you'll see Mount Nebo there, which is close to uh, where they cross over uh, to go into the promised land. The first place they hit is uh, Jericho, so you can see it across the Jordan River. So we'll get into that next week. But this is where they're camped, across the river, outside of Jericho. And uh, Moses, and we're in the Deuteronomy now. Deuteronomy is Moses' last words. He knows he can't go into the promised land. He knows he's about to die. And he warns the people of Israel. And um, one of the things that he says is that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And this is another reference to Christ who will come. Uh, there are um, a lot of good things Moses says, but I'm out of time. Uh, but he warns the people, the Lord will bless you if you obey him. The Lord will curse you if you don't obey him. And he flat out tells them uh, that the Lord will scatter you among his, uh, the peoples. You will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. So Moses tells them that there's going to be an exile. You're going to be driven out because you're going to fail. And this is Lord's judgment. He's going to drive you out of the promised land. And that, that happens later. Hundreds of years later. Um, so Moses goes up to Mount Nebo. You see it on the map there. He's able to look out at the land, the promised land, and see uh, all the land. The Lord shows it to him. And then he dies. And it's really interesting because it says that the Lord buried him. Uh, in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, the Lord buried him. And nobody knows where that was, um, but the Lord buried him. All right. Um, are you guys able to follow, mostly? Yep. Pretty good. Pretty good stuff. All right. Homework for next week is to read Joshua, Judges, and Ruth in the overview. Uh, there's a little introductory page or two in front of... Um, Joshua as well, that would be good for you to read. And then in the whole Bible story, read pages 80 through 105. Uh, I am always available for questions. If you guys have questions in your reading, questions about the lecture, anything, send me an email, text me, call me, we can talk. Um, Joshua, will you close us out? Yes. Hmm. Dear God, thank you for this Sunday morning and for uh, the lesson that we had today. Uh, thank you for giving us your word and uh, the pictures of you in the Old Testament and for uh, choosing us to be your people. I pray that as we go into the service that we would uh, be focused on you and have soft hearts and become more like you. We just say amen.